setup, maybe I should answer the question, uh, why is a financial institution here today uh, meeting with you to talk about emissions trading? And from uh, Bank of America Merrill Lynch's perspective, we have, I think, uh, three reasons um, to be with you today. First of all, uh, we work with many of your companies uh, in uh, areas of banking, whether it's uh, merger and acquisition, or corporate banking, or even on uh, global markets. Companies like Samsung, uh, POSCO, SK, global Korean companies uh, who need uh, outward investment and inward investment. Secondly, we work with the four designated Korean financial institutions, uh, banks like Kexim. Uh, so many of you will know that earlier this year, we helped arrange a $500 million uh, bond, a green bond for Kexim Bank here in, in Korea. And then thirdly, we are an active participant in the Korean commodity markets, specifically as it affects power markets, fuel, and we hope emissions. So we are helping uh, uh, Korean energy companies source fuel from outside Korea. And uh, that could be LNG, it could be coal, uh, it could be gas. Uh, we believe that carbon uh, is an important part of that mix as well. Now, as Ms. Rune Osman explained very clearly, uh, we understand that there are going to be some limitations on what non-Korean financial institutions can undertake, particularly in the early part of the program. But we hope that working with our uh, colleagues in Korean financial institutions, we will still be able to provide the services that uh, would be needed to make the market as efficient as possible. There are three things I wanted to discuss with you today. One is, what are the experiences that a financial institution like Bank of America Merrill Lynch has had from Europe or from the early developments in California? Secondly, what kinds of policies will help to shape the success of the Korean Emission Trading Program? What lessons can we learn from uh, the experience in Europe? And then third, a brief mention about the importance of keeping an evolving strategy because the experience suggests that emission trading programs are not static. They always move. The climate change issue is not a static issue. The science is changing. The policy will change. And therefore, the carbon market will also continue to evolve. Oops. I know there is a lot of information on this slide, and I will be picking just a few parts of it to help uh, make this much more manageable. I know you have the information in your packages to take away home, but I will just explain in brief um, what the perspective of an institution like ours is. So first of all, the big picture. The financial institution is involved in carbon markets to help two things. One, to help manage the price risk. Once a carbon market is a free-floating price of CO2, that is like a variable cost for your companies. A variable cost needs to be managed, as you heard very clearly from uh, Shell on the previous presentation. So think of the way your companies manage variable costs like interest rates or foreign exchange, or the price of oil. You need to adopt the same strategies to manage the risk of uh, carbon dioxide. Secondly, because of the different strategies you can deploy, there are actually many ways you can use to reduce your cost of compliance, and in some cases, make emissions trading a profitable activity. So now let me discuss very briefly the three areas of activity that financial institutions typically have in emission markets. First of all, we have 
we are acting as a trading counterparty. So in places like the EU and in California, we are already helping companies trade in power and fuel. Because of the links between the power market and the fuel market and emissions, it becomes a very um, effective strategy to manage power, fuel and emissions together. Secondly, we are helping companies buy allowances in the market where their carbon emissions management capacity is quite limited. So in Europe, companies like Shell or companies like the European Utilities have been the most active participants. Companies like cement or steel or pulp and paper, they typically have less capacity to be active in the market and they rely upon financial institutions to help them buy allowances or eligible offsets in the market. And so th those are really the main activities. The rest of it is really around risk management and that's where it gets a little bit more complicated. So let me give you some, some real life examples of four typical activities of a financial institution. And I will try to illustrate with examples. So first, you see those four transaction services. The first one is called a carbon repo. Now, uh, th let me give you an example from a European cement company. So a European cement company wanted to, uh, wanted to um, obtain some financing to help implement some technologies to reduce emissions. Cement is a very CO2 intensive uh, industry. So Bank of America Merrill Lynch will buy a future stream of allowances from the cement company, which provides funding. The company then is able to use that financing to help implement the technology that reduces emissions. And then we have pre-agreed a price where Bank of America Merrill Lynch will buy from the cement company allowances at a future date. That is uh, an example of a carbon repo. The second one is uh, a swap. Now, a swap in the carbon market means, um, again, I'm using an example of, a, let's say, a, um, a steel company. In Europe, production of steel went down significantly after the financial crisis. So steel companies had extra allowances. So we helped the steel company by purchasing allowances and by selling back to that steel company offsets. And the reason we, we did that and the reason it benefited the steel company is first of all, they had extra allowances to sell and secondly, they had a quota of X percent of offsets which they can use. And just as in the Korea Emission Trading Program, Mr. Lee explained that companies have a 10% quota for offsets. Usually, offsets are priced at a level below the allowances. So through that swap that we were able to, to do for the steel company, the company made uh, made money on that swap. Third, options. Now, there are many different types of options, but let me give you an example of an aviation company. I, I know that Korean Airlines and ASEANA are not included in the emission trading program, um, but then that may change as time goes on. So, an aviation company uh, usually manages its jet fuel purchases one to two years ahead because it sees the price of oil as you know oil is a very liquid market and it likes to lock in its exposure to oil so we usually provide what's called a zero cost collar to uh, aviation companies this means you are offering a mix of a call option and a put option which locks in a particular band of uh, pricing, which the, the aviation company is very comfortable with and it can do its treasury and corporate finance planning 
on a forward basis. The same could be done with carbon pricing for companies that have big exposure and as Ms. Osman was explaining, if you have a big exposure and you want to manage it very proactively, maybe you put in place an option. And the fourth area is uh, carbon offset origination and procurement. Uh, this is uh, a service which uh, banks, again, are um, useful partners to work with because we are able to absorb the risk of the project, the, the, the risk that the number of credits that might be generated would be less than expected, and also the future price risk of those uh, carbon credits. So really that is a quick synopsis of what a financial institution does for uh, compliance emitters in other markets like Europe and California. Now, let me just explain uh, a few ideas about areas that I think would be beneficial for your companies to focus on as you go into the stakeholder consultation process with the Ministry of Environment. And this is again a very long list, but I'm going to just pick three uh, based on what I heard this afternoon from Mr. Hyung Sop Lee. I think uh, these are three areas which um, are important questions. The first one, he mentioned the fine for non-compliance of 100,001 per ton. The way the fines work in Europe, you have to pay a fine plus you have a makeup provision. So for every ton that you are out of compliance, you must also pay the price of that ton. The, uh, I think there is still a question in Korea whether there is going to also be a makeup provision. And it's an important question because it might affect what your strategy is for uh, compliance in the program. Secondly, there was some discussion about the use of yet to be determined Korean offsets. Now, if the Korean program allows Korean CDM credits to be imported into Korea, there is unfortunately a complicated information technology um, challenge. I know Korea is very strong in information technology, so I'm not so worried. But I think that um, it's an important question nonetheless. All of the, Korea, uh, all of the uh, UN uh, CDM credits come from a registry which is based in, uh, w within, within the UN system. So the Korean National Registry would have to have a link in place with the UN system in Bonn. Secondly, because some of the Korean CDM credits have already been issued, and the ones which are not yet turned in for compliance by other buyers are sitting in registry accounts in Europe, in Switzerland, possibly in Japan, maybe in Australia, it will be very important for those credits to be able to come back home to Korea if Korean companies wish to use those credits as compliance instruments. So that is another information technology challenge which is very important to uh, address. And of course, the third question again comes back to offsets, which is the last point here, eligibility of instruments. One of the experiences we had in Europe was that the European Commission changed the rules about what is an eligible offset in the European market. And this caused many companies, the emitters, as well as those who are providing uh, the, what we call the project developers, those who are developing the projects, quite a bit of pain because the rules were changing as the game was being played. So I think it's very important for your companies to ask the Ministry of Environment what will be the rules about eligibility of offsets. Will it be Korea CDM projects? If it is, then will it include N2O and HFC projects? 
because Europe and Australia do not allow HFC and n 2 projects. So that is one important question. Another one might be to do with the date of um, the vintage, the date of the, the project credit. Uh, will there be a rule about project registration date? When, when did the project become registered with the UN FCCC? Or will it be permitted for its first crediting period and not for its second crediting period? Those are the kinds of important details that will make a difference to your compliance strategies and therefore the risks and the costs that you will incur as a compliance buyer. And I think I will leave my presentation on the critical policies at that, uh, but of course happy to take more questions.